The church of Galatia, before coming to know Jesus, they were Greek pagans. Here's what that means. That means they were party people. It means they were living it up. They were really worshiping idols and they were trying to appease those idols. What are they being tempted by in this moment that Paul is writing? The false teachers have said, if you really want to be accepted by God, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. You must be moral and obey everything in the law to be accepted. Become more moral and Jesus will accept you. Now hang with me, based off of their background of appeasing the little g gods of the day, it's not a stretch for them to now be thinking based off of what the religious leaders are teaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. We must appease God by keeping the law. This is why Paul is so fired up. The little g God idol worship was about appeasing the God who was angry. The agriculture God, I got to keep him okay with me so I can have my crops. The sea God, I need to keep okay with me so he doesn't wipe us out with a typhoon or a hurricane or that it will rain and we can have the crops. So it's not a stretch to go, that's right, I got to keep God happy with me by obeying the things. So Paul's saying, I know you are living promiscuous and sleeping around and offering sacrifices to the liturgy gods and now you're thinking about following a strict moral law. Well, guess what? From God's perspective, those things are same. They are both idolatry. Paul is saying being moral for the acceptance of God is just as enslaving as the way the ways of the world had you deceived and in bondage. Or maybe I could say it this way. You can make an idol out of your work, your family, your money, and in doing so refuse grace and attempt to be your own Lord and Savior. Or you can become incredibly committed to religious rule keeping and in doing so refuse grace and still attempt to be your own Lord and Savior. It's the exact same thing. You're just as enslaved. Jesus himself drives the same point home when he tells that familiar story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, if you've never read it, give it a read this week. A father had two sons, one who squandered everything on crazy, wild, sinful living, one son who was incredibly moral and loyal. The younger brother living it up, eventually finding himself in the pig pen, no place to truly rest. The older brother, well, he was righteous, he did everything right. But listen, both brothers were actually attempting to control their father. And both brothers were lost. The difference is the younger brother comes to a place of realizing his lostness. The older brother never does. Or as Tim Keller is known for saying, it is possible to avoid Jesus as savior as much by keeping all the biblical rules as by breaking them. And here's the thing. Uh, it's just so, it's so sneaky. The temptation that you need to prove yourself to God or that you need to prove yourself to others or you need to prove yourself to yourself. It's not a one-time thing that you put to death. I think it sneaks up all the time. This idea that you have to earn it. And that's why I'm asking us to do the heart work today and listen to the spirit. How many of you have ever seen the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan? Show of hands. A lot of us. Okay, yeah, okay. 
I wanna talk about the movie for a second. So it's been out for a while, so if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna go ahead and ruin it for you, all right? Just wanna let you know. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. And if it's, well, this is a holiday break, I was gonna watch Saving Private Ryan. I don't believe you, so <laughs> there's that. They do, in fact, save Private Ryan. That's the, I need to let you know. They actually do, they get him, they get him. But if you remember the movie, towards the end, uh, you got Tom Hanks as he dies. Tom Hanks dies at the end, sorry. So two things, real quick, yeah. They save Private Ryan, Tom Hanks dies. All right, it's out now, you know. That's Cliff Notes. And as Private Ryan comes over, Tom Hanks calls him in close. Do you remember the scene? He calls him in really close and he whispers two words into his ear. Earn it. Earn this. It's like the climactic point of the movie. Yeah. But think of how paralyzing that is. That someone just gave their life for you. And then they whisper to you, go earn this. This is the beauty of the gospel. He has never once whispered in your ear, earn it. Never once. And some of you, based on your background and how you've grown up and where you've grown up, maybe because of what some other pastors and teachers have said, maybe because of what your parents said, maybe just the enemy himself whispering in your ear, you think you have to earn something that Jesus Christ gave his life for. It has been earned. It's free. How, yeah. How does this show up in our lives? There's lots of ways uh, if we're willing to look and sit before the Lord and and let him point it out, this moral righteousness that kind of bleeds in. Like, I love Jesus, but also I've been doing this pretty well. I wanna recommend a book to you. We have a shot over here, there we go. The Gospel-Centered Life, you're looking for something good to read, pick it up, read that over break while watching Saving Private Ryan. <clears throat> They're doing pretty good, they got over 100,000 copies sold evidently, so it's a good one, it's not just, uh, it's, it's not a bad one. In this book, he talks a little bit about different ways that moralistic righteousness can kind of sneak in if we're not paying attention. Some of the things I asked you on the front end of the message uh, also uh, from this book. I'm a, I'm a big fan. So I just want to read. These are going to be on the screen for you. I want to read a couple of these to you. And uh, I'm just going to put them out there and then we'll kind of go with it. It's pretty tense in here today. I get it. So all right, here we go. You ready? Number one, job righteousness, which says... I'm a hard, honest worker, so God will reward me. Hold on before we go to the next one. These are all uh, on the app and will be available to you sometime between now and the end of 2024, evidently. So you don't have to write them all down. We can get them out to you if you're interested. Or you can just buy the book. A lot of them are in the book. I added a couple of my own. I think you'll know when I added some of my own or I'll point it out to you. Here's one, family righteousness. Because I do things right as a sibling, child, or parent, and I have a good family, I get points with God. I'm more godly than parents who can't control their kids. What about theological righteousness? I have good theology and can you know, accurately explain it because I'm right. God prefers me over those with bad theology. We could do church righteousness. I go to a good church, they get it right. Certainly one that is better than most others I'd know. So I get to look down on the other churches, be passive aggressive with them or even have pity on them and God agrees with me too. Let's do intellectual righteousness. I am more well read, more articulate, more culturally savvy than others, which obviously makes me superior to them in some way, shape or form. What about schedule organized righteousness? I am self 
disciplined and righteous and rigorous in my time management and organized, which makes me more mature than others. Flexibility righteousness. In a world that's busy and people become slaves to their schedules, I'm flexible, relaxed, I always make time for others like Jesus because he was obviously a nine on the Enneagram. Shame on those who don't. It's a joke. This is not a statement about the Enneagram one way or another. I was just trying to be kind of funny. And most of you, if you're into the Enneagram, think Jesus was whatever your number was. So you can make that point. What about this one? Mercy, justice, righteousness. I care about the poor and the disadvantaged the way everyone else should. And not only that, I stand up for them. I know Jesus sees me. I have a special place in his heart. Legalistic righteousness. I'm more concerned about holiness than most people I know. I do a fantastic job of keeping all the rules. Financial righteousness. I manage my money wisely in order to stay out of debt. I'm not materialistic or someone who can't control my spending. Or you can think about it this way. I have less money and clothes that aren't as nice as others, but I'm content and humble. Or you can think about it this way. I have these things because we've made good decisions and other people haven't. This will be a fun one for everybody. Political righteousness. You cannot be a real Christian and support a certain party and or candidate or what has become increasingly out there for people to take real pride in is I am apolitical. Not the, not the donkey or the elephant for me. I follow the lamb, right? <laughs> I know, I get the sentiment, I get the sentiment. It's fun to tell the difference between the two services. First service, thought that was hilarious. This service, I might be getting some emails. Anyway, <laughs> tolerance righteousness. I'm open-minded and charitable toward those who don't agree with me. Protestant penance righteousness. No one feels worse about their sin and failures than I do. Guilt and shame are in my DNA, and they motivate me to be better than ever Let's go worship righteousness. All I wanna do is worship, I raise my hands higher. I bow down lower. I sing louder, cry harder. So God definitely favors me. I can't believe everybody around me is not doing what I do. And this is just for the upstate of South Carolina. Sports righteousness. Our coach proclaims to be a Christian, so we win championships. Obviously, God is more pleased with my team. So just let me say it again. To the, degree, to the degree that we're willing to acknowledge we struggle at times with an inner or outer attitude of performance-driven morality for God to accept us or be impressed with us or others to accept us or be impressed with us or for us to accept ourselves or be impressed by ourselves. To the degree the Spirit of God will meet us and lovingly, I think, point out our idols, remind us of who we are in Jesus Christ. I mean, one thing to pay attention to right there would be as I went through the list, which one kind of got under your skin? Which one did you begin to justify pretty quickly? Yeah, but. Pay, I'm just saying when we sit before the Lord and ask the Spirit of God to speak to us, I think a fair question to ask after our time together this morning, how can I be free from my idols? And I think there's two different groups of people. I think there are those of us that know Jesus. I'll talk to you in just a moment. I think there are folks here today who have never met Jesus and you're wondering about how you can break free from your idols. And this is what I would share with you. There is no idol that currently sits on the throne of your life that died for you so you could find life. As a matter of fact, that idol that you're giving yourself to, that anything that is offering to be your everything will actually lead to your death. And in an ironic twist, What God has offered you in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, is the only hope for your idol-making heart. God is the only one that has made you this promise 
while you're looking for life and things that will ultimately lead you to lose your life, God says, I will give the life of my son Jesus so that you actually find life. So whatever your things are, you know your things are different than other people's things, but it's really not unique to you. If you don't know Jesus and you're running after other stuff, the things you're running after, at some point in time, other people have run after those things as well, people that have found and met Jesus. So whatever that thing is that keeps promising you your worth and your validation and you matter, A lot of us in this room have chased after that stuff and we know eventually you'll discover that it's empty. And our prayer for you would be, and maybe somebody prayed your name at the beginning of this service today, is today would be the day that you hear from Jesus that your idol is an empty idol. And if you want Jesus in your own words today, you can tell him, I'm tired of chasing after all these other things to define me. I realize that God's the one who created me. So why would I think all these other things that have been created would be the thing that could save me instead of the one that created me? You can tell him that you start walking with Jesus today. If you are a follower of Jesus and wondering how do I grow in identifying and acknowledging when I'm attempting to be moral enough to earn something from God, because it creeps in, it's so sneaky. How does the truth of the gospel replace every idol that shows up in my life? The answer is actually in the verses we're looking at today. Look back at verse nine, if you would. It'll be on the screen. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, that's it. The word rather can mean more importantly, so let me read it to you again with more importantly there. How can you turn back to idols since you know God and more importantly, you're known by God? That's it. I don't know what kind of formula you were looking for if you were looking for a formula. It's not a formula. God knowing you is much more than God just being aware of you. To truly know someone is to enter into a personal relationship with them. Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 8 that anyone who loves God does so because God knows them. God knows you. So let me ask it again. How does God truly knowing you and loving you combat your idolatry? Richard Lovelace, he was a professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He said it this way. It's a little lengthy, but it's good enough for us to consider as we close today. Christians who are no longer sure that God loves and accepts them in Jesus apart from their present spiritual achievements are subconsciously radically insecure persons, much less secure than non-Christians because of the constant bulletins they receive from their Christian environment about the holiness of God and the righteousness they're supposed to have. Their insecurity shows itself in pride a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness and defensive criticism of other people. They cling desperately to legal pharisaical righteousness, but envy and jealousy and other sin grow out of their fundamental insecurity. What's Richard saying? Why idols? Why the temptation at times to chase after morality as a means of being accepted and righteous with God, to think that he'll love you, like you more, because at times we are all very insecure in regard to God's acceptance of us. We hear from the enemy and from the world all around us the faint whisper earn it. And we either buckle down with our next best attempt that will, goes pretty well leading to our pride or doesn't go that well leading to our discouragement. Those are the only ways that it can go. So 
So constantly trying to prove yourself to God or others or yourself, it leads to grabbing idols, anything, promising everything to, to firm up our self-image. Which by the way is, this isn't in my notes and I'm gonna go a little bit along. Like that is the message you are swimming in 24 seven. You realize this, right? Everybody's telling you to think that you are great. That's how you'll make it. That is the self image world we are swimming in. All the while the beauty of the gospel tells us that the God of the universe is proclaiming, I know you, I love you, I created you, I accept you, I'm for you, I sing over you, you are mine. And so that, that becomes the gospel message that we preach to ourselves every day. We let God speak it over us each day. And we let other people speak it over us on the days we have a hard time accepting it. And we speak it over other people on days that they have a hard time accepting it. And that is the church. That is this church. That is a community of grace.